Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar on the Aged Care Infection Prevention and Control Guide. I am Rhiannon Box, the Assistant Secretary of the Emergency Preparedness and Response Branch here at the Department of Health and Aged Care. Today, I begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the many lands on which we meet. For me here in Canberra, it's the Ngunnawal people and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I extend that respect and acknowledgement to all the traditional custodians of the lands that you are joining us from today. And I warmly welcome all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining us today for this webinar. I am very pleased to be joined today for this presentation by Professor Peter Collignong, AM, who wears many hats, amongst them being the infectious diseases physician and microbiologist at Canberra Hospital, professor at the ANU School of Medicine and Psychology, and the medical advisor for infection prevention and control at the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare. I'm also joined by Lauren DeVries, Senior Practitioner, Nurse Practitioner, Aged Care for the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission, and Professor Alison McMillan, PSM, the Chief Nursing and Midwifery Officer for the Department of Health and Aged Care. Thank you to all of you who have sent through some questions in advance. We will be endeavouring to answer all of your questions at the end of today's presentations. And if you think of a question during today's update, you can submit questions live uh, in the in the Q&A on the right-hand side of your screen, and we will attempt to respond to as many questions as possible today. All questions and answers, including the ones that we might not get to answer today, will be published in a FAQ document on our website following today's webinar. QR codes displayed in our presentation can assist you in locating the referenced material, the slideshow will be made available on our website along with the recording of this webinar. So today we are here to talk about the new IPC guide that was released by the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare in August this year. During COVID-19, it became very evident that there was a need for IPC guidelines specific to the aged care context. The Australian Guidelines for the Prevention and Control of Infection in Healthcare provides an overarching approach to IPC for healthcare organisations. However, there are key differences between acute healthcare settings and aged care that requires additional consideration about how IPC is implemented. The Royal Commission into Aged Care found that routine infection prevention and control practices of in the aged care sector were substandard and recommended that IPC become a primary focus in the revised aged care quality standards. Because there was no specific IPC guide for the aged care sector, the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare developed this guide to support implementation of the new clinical care standard, which is standard five of the strengthened aged care quality standards. There has been extensive consultation with IPC experts in the health and aged care sector and with the public to ensure this guide meets sector needs. The new IPC guide provides guidance on infection control for diverse clients, client types and aged care delivery settings. Our first speaker, Professor Peter Collignong, as I said, is the medical advisor to the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare and the co-chair for the IPC Guidance and Aged Care Reference Group, which led development of this guide. Professor Colin Yong will talk about the key components of the new IPC guide and provide some practical information on how the sector can use this new resource. Thanks, Professor Colin Yong. Thank you very much for having me and for being given this opportunity to talk about this guideline, which I think is important. By way of background, which has already been said in part, we've got infection control guidelines for the healthcare sector, but it's mainly designed for the acute care sector, hospital. And the major difference with aged care is it's where people live. So they're not there for just short periods of time, you know, a few days, a couple of weeks. It's where they live. It's their home, both in the community and in the aged care, you know, nursing homes, etc. So it was important that we came up with something that more was in tune and practical for that situation. Now, I was involved and chaired a number of the previous acute care ones, but, you know, again, it's obvious we, need, we needed something different. And to put this in perspective, 
uh, after we published this, we got a few comments back or I got comments back from people in England, Ireland and Canada who are involved in infection control saying this is probably a world's first. As far as we're aware, there's no guideline like this just, if you like, made or directed to the aged care sector. But that also means um, there's always room for improvement. So I'm sure all of us will take any suggestions anybody has on how we can make it better. Um, and to put it in perspective, this was just not done by, I call myself an academic, um, people, you know, doctors in particular, this was predominantly nurses and predominantly those working in the aged care sector. So we were trying to make it as practical as possible, but without compromising basic infection control principles. So that's where we're coming from. Next slide, please. So the purpose, I, I guess I've gone over a bit, but it, it, from a more formal point of view, is to support the aged care organisations to be able to meet the requirements to strengthen air, air, you know, aged care quality standards, but also as a supplement to the Australian guidelines in prevention and control of infection in healthcare, but which I said are mainly made for the acute sector rather than the aged care sector, and also to try and help everybody who's in involved with infection prevention and control, which I might say should be everybody, um, both the resident, uh, their family and all the staff at all levels, administrators as well as the people on the ground, to try and help them come up with something that will work basically in the aged care setting and on the ground and be practical. Uh, next slide. So how do you use this guide? Well, I guess um, it's 200 pages long, so I wouldn't suggest you just go in there and read it from cover to cover. But it's designed to inform daily practice and education to help the policy development and review at a local level as well, you know, within organisation, to support the understanding of IPC obligations and, you know, what you need to do, the basic principles. And it's to be used in combination with other guidelines to inform a risk assessment, because one of the big deals about this is we're not being black and white. We're saying you've got to make a risk assessment and modify it depending on the circumstances. Um, next slide, please. So um, this is basically, as I said, it's a 200 page document, but it's in 10 chapters and it's designed to be able to, if you like, get to something in a hurry. So each of the chapters has got its own heading where you can go just to that chapter for what you want to look up. But within those chapters, there's a summary at the beginning. I think it's always, you know, just one page, but there's practice points. There's uh, um, points for community and home care, for instance, to make it better to, you know, more practical, just not for aged care homes, but for those in the community. Uh, essential knowledge. And also, if people want to go further, what resources and other links there are as well. So it's designed as a whole document, but it's also designed to try and get people to be able to go to one spot quickly, get what they need without having to read um, 200 pages, so to speak. Uh, next slide. So what is an infection prevention and care system in aged care? Well, there is not one size fits all. Circumstances of people living at home is different to aged care, and even in aged care institutions, it's quite uh, different. So that's why we're not being black and white. We're trying to give the principles, and we're saying, look, you've got to put this into context of where you're going to use this. Uh, and that's why we've tried to make it as practicable as possible also. So it's the service context. It's what resources are available, the availability of those resources, there's certain resources we think should be available all the time, I might say, but, you know, there are issues there. The older person's care needs and the workforce that is looking after them has to be considered. And one of the issues here is family is often workforce as well. So trying to take that into account. And any infection prevention and control system needs to include a few core components. And one is the actual infection prevention and control related guidelines and policies. This is part of that. But education and training. And remember, people come and go. So this is an ongoing issue. You can't do it once and say, oh, that's the end of it. You've got to monitor infections. I mean, and you've got to do audits and feedback. And this is designed to be part of a quality improvement system. And for any quality improvement system, you need to know what you're doing, measure what's happening, 
look at what you're doing and then if things aren't as you know 100% how do you modify to get improvement in the future so this is a process that requires lots of different components these guidelines are just one part of that but it's the whole process we're trying to promote with these guidelines next slide please now when we get to actual infection control uh, precautions, so to speak, and prevention, there's basically standard precautions and then transmission-based ones. And standard precautions are what we should do all the time. And that actually means you've got to assume there may always be infections there. What can you do to make the risk as re low as is reasonable? A big part of that is hand hygiene. A lot of bugs are passed from person to person or between people or from the environment by hand. So basic cleaning, hand hygiene. Um, but basically, also, if you're doing any sterile practices, making sure you've got good um, knowledge and you implement them so that you do that as your standard, so to speak. But on top of that, there can be some extra ways certain bugs or worrying bugs transmit. And essentially, if we put this into two broad categories, this is contact, you know, just from your hands with some multi-resistant organs, for instance, but also respiratory, what people breathe in. And that's, you know, basically the basis here. Next slide. So first of all, let's get to respiratory precautions. Now, there were a few, if I say, controversial things about these guidelines, and this is one of them. Uh, basically, with COVID in particular, but even before that, there's a lot of controversy about how much spread is through small particles called aerosols and how much through larger particles called droplets. Now, the reality is there's a continuum and there's high risk procedures for lots of small particles and there's, you know, ordinary, you know, more ordinary uh, situation. So for the first time, we came up with a term called respiratory precautions instead of aerosol or droplets. So that's different in this, and we did that because we wanted to make these more um, practicable. And respiratory precautions include what you, what some people would call airborne and other droplets. And basically, if you believe you need any sort of respiratory precautions, the minimum you need is a surgical mask, eye protection, which is often forgotten. And the reason eye protection is so important is if people cough, sneeze, do anything, it can go over a people's face, and yes, you can breathe it in, but it also deposits in their eyes. And your eyes, via your lacrimal draft, go to your nose. So basically, if you don't protect your eyes, you're leaving a lot of your respiratory tract unprotected. So that's why the eye protection is there. And it also means you do standard precautions all the time. Uh, next slide. Now, this is where one of the controversies come in. Um, some people believe that you need, you know, respirators, N95 masks at all time. We consciously made a decision to say this is going to be on a risk basis. Most of the time, if there is a respiratory um, concern, we believe surgical masks with eye protection and other standard things will give you very high levels of protection. But there are situations where you will want to take higher levels of protection or potentially because we don't know. And some of it is to do with the virulence of the organism and the low numbers you need to get infected, such as tuberculosis, for instance. Um, there is also increased risk depending on the circumstances. You know, an older person has got a respiratory infection, but they're also on a nebulizer or something that produces high levels of smaller particles. That's where we think, um, particularly healthcare workers, need to take a, a, an in increased level of protection. The other thing is the room well ventilated, you know, engineering issues. And also if people are cognitively impaired, if you've got a whole lot of people who are infected with dementia, wandering around everywhere, unable to, if you like, um, you know, follow directions, etc., then there is an increased risk. So they're all factors that you take into account in your risk assessment. Now, just another thing to put in perspective, there is a lot of controversy about this. But when you look at all the available evidence from Cochrane reviews, a recent review done by Greenhall et al., and one done at the end of the last year by WHO, at least in acute medical situations, you can't actually show, if you like, that N95 respirators end up with less disease in staff compared to surgical masks. Now, having said that, we still believe uh, masks are a benefit and we believe in higher risk situations, for the moment we would recommend them, 
but this is an area where we need a lot more research to be able to answer these questions properly. So we're going a bit further necessarily than the literature said, but we think it's what the expectation is at the moment and a reasonable uh, assessment of the risk. Next slide. Now, this whole thing with risk management and, and assessment, aged care settings differ um, both within the organisation and what happens locally. And essentially, the best thing you can do to eliminate, uh, well, to not have an infection risk is to eliminate it. Well, that's not always very practical. So one of the things you have to do is have a risk accept acceptance. In other words, while we try and get it down to as low as possible, we can't make it zero. We have to do the best we can. And just as an example on this, this hierarchy of controls, um, you know, things like vaccine, if you look at the bottom of that right hand of the slide, the least protective is personal protective equipment. All the others are most more important. And I might say vaccination comes into this as well. You get much more protection by being appropriately vaccinated and, st and both staff and residents than you will very likely from whatever PPE you have put in place. But this is all a risk assessment and it's different in different situations. Next slide. Um, what was very important in this is this was person-centred care. So they differ from age, acute care services, and that's why, some, you know, it, while we're not compromising, we think, basic infection control principles, the practical suggestions may end up different to what you see in a hospital. And there needs to be a balance. Maintaining the environment that minimises the spread of infection, but also the impact of those residents that are in that situation and making sure they have a life and this is their home and they continue to live reasonably. So we must ensure that the charter of aged care rights and workers' rights as well are prioritised. Um, and this particularly comes in with isolation, which was a very other controversial issue. Um, isolation should only be implemented when the benefit from the isolation is far greater than the risk of psychological, emotional and physical harm. And next slide. Uh, and this was another controversial issue. We basically thought, you know, this prolonged isolation should never happen. Um, there should be at least one person that can visit somebody, whatever. I mean, during COVID, so many people died without family there when they were dying. Now, we need to decrease the risk of infection, but isolating people for a prolonged period of time, we thought was we got the balance right wrong if we did that excessively. Um, next slide. The other thing is vaccination. We think vaccination is very important, both for staff and for residents, and it should be encouraged as, you know, very much encouraged and make it easy for people to get vaccinated by having on-site vaccination, for instance, wherever that's feasible. But unless it's required by state or public health re regulation, we didn't think it should be mandated. Now, that's another controversial issue, but we thought it should be promoted but not mandated for a whole lot of reasons, both for residents and even for staff. So workforce screening and vaccination should be there and they should significantly reduce the transmission of vaccine preventable diseases. So we think vaccines are very important. And obviously, the older you are and the more underlying factors you have, the bigger your risk. And therefore, you know, 80 year olds with underlying disease, we really need to promote it and make it available for them. Uh, next slide. So there are a lot of resources in this uh, document, um, um, and this is just some of them. Some of them can be used for consumers, but we purposely tried in the document to make uh, it available in a way that we thought people could take in without having to read you know, page to page. So I won't go on that further, but there are lots of things there. Next slide. Next slide, sorry. So, oh, well, that's, that's the end of my talk. So. Thank you very much, and I hopefully there'll be time at the end questions. Thank you very much, Professor Colin Young. Our next speaker today is Lauren DeVries. Lauren is going to talk about how the new IPC guide can assist aged care homes to meet infection prevention control requirements under the strengthened aged care quality standards. Thanks, Lauren. Thank you so much. Um, today I'm just going to talk to you about the key components of the new aged care infection prevention and control guide and how the guide actually intersect, 
intersects with the strengths and standards and how it can be used to support providers to meet their obligations under the Aged Care Act. So next slide. So just some information that I'm sure you're all aware of, you know, older people receiving aged care are typically, you know, much more frailer than, than other older people. Often they have chronic progressive health conditions and their health is not robust. They tend to be more vulnerable to infection, both contracting infectious diseases and being seriously affected by them. Infection prevention and control is a critical component of delivering safe and quality care to older people. And aged care providers have a responsibility to ensure that their policies, practices and processes are, are current and up to date and that staff have the required level of training, competence and supervision to manage infection prevention and control. And of course, it's not just about COVID-19, but obviously that really uh, concentrated our minds to this issue. Next slide. So um, we, we can see, and I think that, um, you know, the Aged Care Infection Prevention and Control Guide really does outline the principles and supports the implementation of the strengthened aged care quality standards. So we really need to understand and, and know about this guide Next slide. So I just included um, the current standards. Um, I'm sure you're all very familiar with those, but I think it's important to, to understand that this applies currently as well, not just for the um, strength and standards. Next slide. So the current standards, um, we know that infection prevention gets looked at against the standards and we can see in particular 33B, 33G, 8.3D and 8.3E, where it's really becomes quite focused in what we're looking at. All right, the next, thank you. Um, what we expect from providers all of the time is that genuine partnership with older people that respects and and really animates the individual's rights. We, we also expect that the provider is meeting obligations and reaching for that high quality care. And we're always looking to see if providers are looking for opportunities to improve. What we expect when things go wrong is a remedy and then the provider to restore and then the provider to look at prevention as well. All right, next slide. So getting ready for the new legislative provisions. Um, the Commission is supporting sector readiness for the new Aged Care Act and the new strengthened aged care quality standards and regulatory framework. Through our education, information and targeted communications, we aim to support older people to understand what to expect from their care and how the Commission can help when their aged care experience falls short. We want providers to understand their obligations and we want providers to understand what they um, need to expect to see in the delivery of care and how we will assess performance and how we will regulate. We want workers to also understand their obligations. They, workers need to understand what is important in delivering safe quality care and how the Commission can help them to raise their concerns. We know that the new Aged Care Act will put the rights of older people at the centre of our aged care system. Um, obviously, subject to parliamentary processes, the Act is expected to commence on the 1st of July 2025. The new Act creates a simple single entry point to make access to the aged care system for older people easier. It includes a fair, culturally safe, single assessment process. It includes rules on supported decision making to ensure that the older person has choice and control. Uh, the new Act provides additional protections for whistleblowers to allow reporting without fear or reprisal. It introduces a new approach to regulating aged care providers to ensure the delivery of safe quality aged care. And it also strengthens the power of the regulator. So that's the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission so that we can manage the risk, ensure integrity and support aged care. The new regulatory model will improve outcomes and protections for older people. And it responds to the 18 recommendations from the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety. This model delivers a universal provider registration and renewal of registration across six different 
categories. There's clear, targeted and streamlined aged care provider obligations. And it's a system that is easier for older um, adults and aged care providers to access and navigate. It provides support to aged care providers to build their capability. It's going to be a consistent way to provide feedback and promptly address complaints and concerns with a focus on resolving issues respectfully and adequately and provides that stronger regulatory powers for the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission. So we see the um, new, I've just included um, the strength and aged care quality standards um, will not apply to all registration categories. And I think that's important to understand. They will only apply to providers in specific registration categories. Um, and there is further information um, on our website in regards to that. But I think it's really important to know that the standards apply to both home care and residential care services as well. All right, next slide. Um, so we know that the strength and aged care quality standards aim to be simplified um, to provide comprehensive and measurable um, standards. We're going from eight to seven standards. There's going to be strength and focus areas and each standard has intent and expectation statement and has outcomes and actions that are clear. All right, next slide. So if we focus in more on the standards, we see the new standard, standard one, the person. So firstly, at a more general and overarching level, the person, particularly 1.1, uh, person-centred care, is a fundamental concept where providers need to recognise that the safety, health, well-being, and quality of life of the older person is the primary consideration in the delivery of care. Um, we can see that our Outcome 1.3 um, ensures that providers uh, must ensure that older people are supported to exercise dignity of risk. And it's really important to remember that all adults have the right to make decisions about their, their care um, and um, to have those decisions respected, even if this is something that creates a risk to the individual themselves. Dignity of risk means respecting this right and care and services need to strike a balance between respect for the older person, uh, their autonomy and the protection of other people's rights. Um, so that's really important to remember. The guide um, that we're talking about today aligns with this concept and provides advice to consider the needs of older people and place them at the centre of infection prevention and control. It also describes the importance of enabling older people to start to take part in their own care with careful consideration to balancing their needs in relation to mental health and social well-being whilst also minimising the spread of infection and the impact on others receiving care in that area. The guide recognises the unique context of aged care and how this differs from the acute sector. Focus on minimising infection related risks in aged care, which require careful consideration um, to ensure quality of life to older people. All right, next slide. Thank you. Um, so standard two is the organisation and providers need to demonstrate that they have the right systems and processes and workforce to deliver safe quality care. Um, we can see in outcome 2.2, um, quality and safety culture, where providers need to ensure the health and well-being of older people and the, work, and the workforce. Chapter seven of the guide talks to the important aspects of staff health and safety, covering IPC workplace hazards, worker screening and vaccination programs. Chapter eight of the guide covers infection prevention, immunisation and the wellbeing of the older person. There is also alignment with outcome 2.4, which is risk management, where providers must use a risk management system to identify, manage and assess and continuously review um, the risks to older people, workers and the provider's operation. Chapter two of the guide describes risk management and risk assessment for infection prevention and how to apply it in aged care. Um, 
So next slide, please. So standard four, the environment. Um, so we can really see um, that the environment outcome 4.2 is infection prevention and control. Um, and there are 11 very specific actions, which include having appropriate infection prevention control systems implemented and ensuring that workers take appropriate infection prevention precautions when providing care and services. These enhancements all expand um, upon the existing IPC requirements in the current standards, um, but in relation to the guide, particularly chapters four and five, they provide advice and guidance to support the provider to demonstrate compliance within the strengthened standards. And the last um, standard that we'll highlight is standard five, clinical care. Uh, so of course, if we move to standard five, this is focused on ensuring providers can demonstrate they are delivering safe and quality care to older people. We can see in 5.1, we've got clinical governance, and this has significant importance related to um, IPC. Uh, chapter one of the guide, looks and describes the importance of clinical governance and the current and your IPC systems. In outcome 5.2, preventing and infect preventing and controlling infections in clinical care, this is where providers need to demonstrate they have implemented an evidence-based practice antimicrobial stewardship system relevant to the specific context where they provide care and services, be that residential or home care settings. There is definitely an uplift um, from the current standards and this I, new IPC guide covers various aspects of antimicrobial, antimicrobial stewardship, touching on antimicrobial resistance in aged care and the main components of an antimicrobial system. All right, next slide. So IPC and Commission campaign. So should the Commission turn up and conduct an infection control spot check, uh, Commission staff will use the infection control monitoring checklist, uh, which is available on our website. So I would encourage you to go and have a look at that. Um, over the past four quarters, more than half of our on-site assessment visits in residential care have been focused on risks that we consider are broadly present across the sector. So particularly COVID-19 and infection prevention and control. In response to low COVID-19 vaccination rates and a growing number of COVID-19 outbreaks in residential aged care, the Commission started um, some unannounced targeted assessment contacts at 107 services and included 21 on-site activities in the last quarter. Some services were subject to both an off-site and on-site activity, um, and there were a small number of providers who were found to be non-compliant uh, with vaccine-related requirements under the current aged care quality standards. Uh, these services are now under uh, case management and they have been required to advise the Commission of their proposed actions to address the non-compliance, which include um, immediate staff vaccinations, training, updated policies and procedures, and increasing communication with residents um, and, re and representatives. Um, and we continue to engage with these providers and other providers to make sure that the actions taken um, uh, uh, continue um, and deliver the intended outcomes. All right, next slide. So the guide um, can really support the sector to comply with the the quality standards. Um, and I think that's really important to understand. The, the new standards offer greater clarity on the expectations for infection prevention and antimicrobial stewardship, making it explicit what providers must demonstrate to comply with the strength and aged care quality standards. Providers can minimise infection risk by applying evidence-based IPC strategies and following endorsed guidelines and applying this to the care delivery context. The principles of IPC are very well established and there should be you know, no, no surprises 
The benefit of this publication is that it has been created specifically for the aged care residential community or home care environment and takes into consideration the vulnerabilities of infection and the goals of care of older people. Um, the guide is particularly um, useful in informing the sector and also the commission on what is available for providers to undertake to meet the quality standards. Um, and this was obviously not previously addressed in Australian guidelines before. Um, the commission welcomes the guide because, ha because it has a greater focus on supporting services to implement infection prevention, infection control and antimicrobial stewardship in aged care settings, both home care and residential care. And next slide. Thank you. Um, so I've just got a couple of examples. Um, so the first example is how the guide could be useful to support providers with demonstrating compliance with some of the IPC requirements in the new strength and standards. Um, and we can see that in the new strength and standards under um, Standard 5, clinical care, so outcome 5.6, cognitive impairment. Uh, the provider needs to identify and respond to the complex clinical care needs of, a pe of people with delirium, dementia and other forms of cognitive impairment. Um, and we can see that providers need to ensure that they assess the risk for each older person in their care, considering the specific complex needs of that individual um, to assess and manage the IPC risk. The guide supports the understanding of the basic principles of IPC and how to apply these principles using a risk-based approach to minimise infection-related risk. This includes where older people are living with a cognitive impairment or dementia and may be unable to adhere to infection prevention practices. The guide recognises that it might not be possible to eliminate all infection-related risks associated with providing care for a consumer like this, and that some interventions can result in prolonged restrictions, such as isolation related to transmission-based precautions. The guide uses the term risk-based isolation to support providers and workers to understand the benefits of isolation strategies, but also the risks. Uh, the guide really is a systematic risk assessment approach to inform appropriate management. It recognises that interventions must be informed by consideration of the risks and benefits of the older person and worker. Um, the guide does provide suggestions on approaches to mitigate infection risks. Um, the next um, example, please. So, Anti, the, the second example is just how the IPC guide aligns with the current strength quality standards, sorry, with the strength and quality standards. Um, and we can see again, um, standard five, outcome 5.2, preventing and controlling infections. Um, and our draft guidance suggests what is needed for providers to establish an antimicrobial stewardship system. And that includes developing policies and procedures to promote the appropriate use of antimicrobials for older people, education and training for staff, and quality improvement processes for identified antimicrobial issues. Our draft guidance also provides information about the importance of monitoring, ongoing review and improvement for antimicrobial stewardship. By auditing, conducting regular surveillance, analysing the data and reporting regularly to the governing body, prescribers and older people. In this respect, the guide aligns very well with the strength and standards as it describes the components of an antimicrobial system and the suggested roles and responsibilities. Um, just to to end, um, so the final slide that we've got is just a reminder that the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission does have a, a range of resources um, in relation to infection prevention and control and also um, a, a range of supports for you as a provider. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lauren. 
I would now like to welcome Professor Alison McMillan, who will talk about the differences between the new IPC guide and the Communicable Diseases Network of Australia National Guideline for the Prevention, Control and Public Health Management of Outbreaks of Acute Respiratory Infection in Residential Aged Care Homes. Uh, otherwise known as the CDNA RE guidelines, and how these resources should be applied in your settings. Thanks, Professor McMillan. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you, Rhiannon. So you've heard the key component, components of the IPC guidelines and how they provide, um, as Peter has said, the practical advice. And Lauren has talked to you about how the IPC guidelines align with the current legislation and of course, the strengthening edge care quality standards. Um, so you've got a real sense of that. Now, um, it, we felt it was also important though to explain how the aged care IPC guide uh, can be used with other guidance. So as Rhiannon has called them, and I'll say them again. So the Communicable Disease Network of Australia National Outbreak Management Guidelines for Accrued acute respiratory infection in residential aged care homes. We really are good in the Commonwealth at making really long titles. So I'm going to call them the CDNA RE guidelines um, and talk about how these, these and of course the new uh, quality standards, these are all synergistic uh, approaches to things that will help you uh, achieve the highest possible care and support to older people um, in their homes and then residential settings. So the IPC guidelines is a comprehensive resource. You've heard that from Professor Colling, offering practical information and developing knowledge around um, both residential and home care settings. These gu this guide should be your primary reference, particularly in areas such as developing policies and procedures, um, including education, training, audits and surveillance. These are the things that should help you too in planning and preparing should and when you have an infectious diseases outbreak of what of the cause, flu, RSV or COVID and help you by updating your emergency and outbreak management plans. Many of you who may well have been on these webinars before have talk, heard me talk about clinical governance and the continuous need for quality improvement. Again, this guide will help you with that, uh, reducing the overall infection risk and can't emphasize enough again, encouraging vaccination for both residents and aged care workers um, is such an important part of our approach to preventing um, infectious diseases. So the IPC guide also talks about having a antimicrobial stewardship or AMS program. Now I know you all, all understand that we now realize that we need to use um, antibiotics only when they're indicated because we we will see and continue to see uh, antimicrobial resistance grow. Um, the AMS program uh, should be tailored to the situation which we are describing and, and this the guide will help you to think about that. The CDNA RE guidelines should be your resource to go to when you're dealing with an outbreak. Now we all know and I'm sure you all know the first time you open these guidelines shouldn't be the first time you, when you have an outbreak. You need to be using these guidelines again in your preparation and how you're going to respond to a new respiratory outbreak with residents, how then during an outbreak you can implement the measures that are described for you in the IPC guidelines, how you can manage case contacts, how you can look at the treatment protocols and interventions you can do. And of course, we learned so well the importance of effective communication with staff, residents and their families during an outbreak. So again, these work together um, to help guide you through how you would manage an outbreak. Um, during the pandemic, definitely we all know it became exceedingly clear that IPC protocols and practices in aged care settings can save lives over the duration of MEF. This time when many of us have worked together through some of these challenges, we have seen enormous improvements and significant development in the ability for um, uh, the prevention, response and recovery from outbreaks. And, and to that, I, um, I congratulate many of you on the amazing work that's been done 
to address these. And, and now we see these new IPC guidelines, as Professor Collin has suggested, perhaps the first in the world with a, a really key focus on, on aged care is will help further develop. But we can't take our eye off the ball um, at, at any point in time because, as we know, any infection will exploit any chink in our armour. I think it, both uh, previous speakers have talked about the the experience we now realise in the impact of restricted measures on our uh, residents and, that, and therefore any approach we make needs to be balanced and risk-based and needs to include residents and their families in decision-making. So the, the CDNA RE guidelines do go to the, to the importance of taking what's called office in public health a proportion approach in managing risk, but also considering residents' well-being we don't want to further be detrimental to residents' well-being through our approaches. And as I say, it's important to include where you can um, residents and their, and their or their family and work through issues around min, around uh, visitation and minimising risk. Uh, already, I've already mentioned, and, and I know the previous two speakers have done this, but it it is without doubt one of the most important things we need to do is to keep those vaccination rates up. I know for many of us who've been around since the beginning of the pandemic, this can feel like it's just a, a continuous circle that we're never going to get out of, and it really is, and, and we need to accept that. Spring weather is here and it's getting warmer. That leads towards a festive period, and we know that that will see an increase in the circulation of viruses because we just all get out and about more. So continuing to um, promote, advocate, educate, um, and help people make informed decisions around vaccinations is a very important part of your role and everyone's role. So current recommendations are all people over 75 years should re receive two doses of the vaccine each year, two doses each year. Currently, only 53% of aged care residents over 75 years are up to date with their COVID vaccines, and that's not high enough. And we know we'll see increased numbers of outbreaks as we go towards Christmas, and we would really, really love to see more vaccinations being delivered before that time. <coughs> Excuse me. So if your resident client has not already had a vaccination this year or six months since their last vac vaccination, they're eligible. We've tried to make this now as simple as we can. HK Homes can arrange COVID vaccination clinics ahead of Christmas so we can ensure residents have full protection um, and I'll also remind her that we no longer need to wait six months after a COVID infection to get a vaccine. Um, vaccines are free for people over 65. So again, I'll reiterate important role in informing discussion of residents and their families around the importance of vaccination. Um, Thank you again for all you do in supporting our most vulnerable in our community. We've talked a lot about IPC and each of its parts that we're seeing these new IPC guidelines, the new um, quality standards are coming as in association with the Act and, of course, some of the existing documentation that comes, for instance, from the Communicable Disease Network of Australia. So thank you, um, and I'll hand back to Rhiannon. Thank you so much, Alison. So we will now use the last 10 minutes of this webinar to move to the question and answer section and we will attempt to get through as many questions as we can. Uh, we will be starting with some of the pre-submitted questions that we've received in the lead up to this webinar. And the first question I have is for Lauren. And the question is, is there an environmental risk assessment tool already established that community care providers can use? Thanks, Lauren. Thank you. Um, so there is no environmental risk assessment tool that's currently established or recommended, um, but what the Commission or what the legislation talks about is each individual provider should develop their own tool that they can develop, implement and review, dependent on the service that they offer and the environment that they are visiting. Uh, the environmental risk assessment is not something that's unique, I guess, just to highlight to infection prevention. Rather, this needs to be part of the provider's 
systems and processes and an environmental risk assessment should be undertaken prior to commencement of any engagement with a consumer just to manage um, and support the potential risks in the environment. Thanks very much, Lauren. Uh, the next question I have is for Alison. And that question is, what does this look like in home care, particularly in regards to competency, competency assessment? Thanks, Alison. Thanks, Lauren, and thanks to whomever provided us this question. So advice given by the department but in the context of aged care does and can include home care, um, CS, CHSP, uh, and recognises the particular vulnerability um, of older people in the in in the in the old age groups, IPC practices are extremely important in residential care settings, but they're it's equally important in home settings, where home care providers often are delivering very close personal care due to the risk of transmission. Now, Professor Conyong talked about some of those principles in his presentation, and those principles exist in any care setting, acute, residential or home care, there are these principles that one should follow. However, we understand that and realise that the complexity of this when delivering these in someone's home is just an added uh, challenge when um, clinic where clinical procedures may be feel, you know, done in an environment. So again, it's contextual in home care, but those essential principles in my mind remain the same. Um, and, and they will be about then working in a home care setting with the recipient or the client of care around their role, your role and the environment in which you're operating. So your, your uh, staff and support workers and health professionals need to understand these principles. And so in the context of competency assessment, a competency assessment is, is an element of this, but it is so important. And we heard that. Um, in one of the previous presentations, this is a continuous process. Educating staff, reminding staff, we know that knowledge drops off quite quickly. You know that we have high turnovers of staff in some situations. So it is about making sure that, that staff have completed training and that they can um, provide evidence through their feedback or through a competency test, if you choose to, to make sure that they are familiar with their, their responsibilities and preventing um, the transmission of infection to those most vulnerable. So, yes, these principles can exist in home situations as well, and that's part of the risk assessment and applying, applying those principles that are so clearly explained in the IPC guidelines. Thanks, Rhiannon. Thanks, Alison. Uh, the next question I have is for Professor Collignong, and that question is, will there be a complementary consumer guide produced to assist consumers with understanding the provider's obligations? Thanks, Professor Collignong. Well, there is already some information there. Um, there is at least one page that says how to stay safe and prevent infections with an infograph. So, and that's designed for everybody, but you know, residents and their families should be able to understand that as well. As time goes on, I hope individual organisations, but other people expand that to make it more applicable because this won't work unless we have the residents and their families as part of this as well. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, the next question I have is for you again, Professor Collignong, and that question is, why has the guide focused on respiratory precautions rather than current droplet and airborne precautions? Well, I, I'm, I hope I touch this. Um, can you hear me? Okay. I hope I touch this in my talk. Basically, um, there's a continuum between aerosols and droplets. So we took the view that basically you've got to look, make a risk assessment, and in high risk situations from aerosols, that's where you need respirators and, and N95 masks. And an example of that is using nebulizer. But equally, you've got to look at decreasing the risk. And one of the ways you can do to increase that risk is to use spaces instead of a nebulizer, for instance, get rid of the risk. Now, for other things as CPAP machines, again, that's where we regard it as higher risk. WHO and others have got a list of what they regard as producing large numbers of aerosols, and we're recommending N95 respirators for that. But for the rest, we think on available evidence, you get very good um, um, protection 
by wearing a surgical mask and eye protection. And that is much more comfortable and it's much more likely we'll get compliance with that than if, um, you know, you go for an N95 mask all the time at all times. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, the next question I have is for you again, Professor Collignon, and that is, do IPC leads know what to factor into their risk assessment when determining if PFRs should be used? Well, again, um, as part of our document, we're saying the individual IPCs have got to make a risk assessment. We give some of the criteria, like I've given there, you know, nebulizers, how much aerosols are produced. But it's also if you've got wandering people with dementia who may have an infection. So there's no one black and white answer. The IPC on the ground, along with others involved in these decision makers, need to look at all these factors. There's minimum standards we have. If they want to apply more, that's part of the risk assessment and information they've got to collect on the ground and make a decision at that time. Thank you. Uh, and the next question I have is for you once again, Professor Colin Young, and that is, were pre infection prevention and control experts who work in the area of aged care consulted about the changes to transmission-based precautions, combining droplet and airborne precautions and the use of N95 masks at the discretion of leads who may be inexperienced in this area? Well, the short answer is yes, yes and yes. I mean, the most of the panel consisted of people with an infection control expertise or at least a lot of experience in aged care. And I can tell you there was a lot of discussion about this and there was consensus. We didn't even have to take a vote. We were trying to come up with something that protected patients and staff but was practical and would go into the medium to long term. And that's where we are arrived at. We also sent this out for public consultation, again, to the aged care sector and others. And... The overwhelming, I would think, 95% plus approved of what we put out. So we don't actually say we're, you know, absolute and we know the answers, but we've taken lots of things into consideration. And as far as we can see, the overwhelming majority of the people who work in the sector agree with this approach that we've taken. Fantastic. Thank you. And the very last question I have is for Alison, and that is how are we supporting healthcare staff, cleaners, nursing and support staff to be updated on cleaning infection control? Where can we access online training for our aged care workers with the new infection prevention and control guide applied? Thanks, Alison. Uh, given the time constraints we've got, I'll go absolute to the point. Um, home care providers and aged care providers should be implementing effective systems and processes for IPC. And this includes training for all workers, including health professional and support workers. Chapter six of the new aged care infection prevention guide addresses cleaning, safe and hygienic environments. And there's also, also more information on environmental cleaning and IPC that can be obtained from the Australian Commission on Safety and Health and Qualities in Healthcare's website. Uh, and finally, uh, ACIPC, the Australasian College of Infection Prevention and Control, have resources specific to environmental cleaning, including in, um, and ACIPC are holding a webinar as part of their aged care IPC community of practice on the 16th of October, um, which will help people. And so go to the SIPC website. They're delivering aged care specific training. That's where you'll get the very best expert advice on how to manage this um, from the expert group. Thanks, Rhiannon. Thanks so much, Alison. And that concludes today's webinar. Uh, all the questions that we didn't have a chance to answer, we will be publishing um, answers on our website. Uh, we would appreciate if you could please stay online and, and complete a short, short survey to help us improve our webinars. Please scan the QR code or follow the link that we have posted in the Q&A. The survey will take about one to three, one minute to answer three short questions. Thank you to everyone who was able to join us today and thank you to our panel presenters. We hope everyone has found this session useful. Thank you.